A short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. So this is part of our arc of big deep sea concepts and habitats. So we started off with seamounts, with ash. And those are obviously big volcanic formed features. So the next thing is probably hydrothermal vents. And we're going to speak with Professor Charles Chuck Fisher, marine biologist and recently retired professor of biology at Pennsylvania State University. His research has been influential in the field of cold seeps and hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. And specifically, his research has focused on the physiology of animals and the ecology of these habitats. So here we go. Let's call Chuck. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Professor Charles Chuck Fisher. Thanks so much for coming and having a chat with us, Chuck. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So can we start off with with what creates these habitats? What's the sort of geological context? Well, hydrothermal vents are formed in areas of the deep sea where the plates that make up the crust of the planet are spreading apart. New sea floors being formed and superheated water is venting out full of nutrients for a variety of different types of bacteria. So what, what makes them so interesting from a, a biological perspective? They're sort of unlinked to the traditional energy sources we, we see on most of, most of Earth. Well, actually, that's exactly what makes them most interesting, in my opinion, is the fact that they are environments where energy is being produced by bacteria in a form that animals can utilize. So they can be decoupled from the rest of the planet. They, of course, need oxygen, which does come ultimately from photosynthesis on the surface. But the energy sources are coming out of the deep earth. And what sort of chemistry is is going on here? How is biological energy being produced from these chemicals? Are there different types or is it the same reaction in a few different places? Well, there's actually a variety of different chemicals that bacteria can use for autotrophy, that is to use as an energy source to grow. The primary one at most hydrothermal vents is hydrogen sulfide which is actually formed deep underneath the Earth's crust where hot water is reacting in an anaerobic environment with heated rocks, and it's leached from those rocks and ultimately released at the seafloor. But that's not the only chemical that can provide energy for bacterial autotrophy. Methane is another very important one. And in fact, there's a wide variety of reduced chemicals, reduced metals, all of which bacteria can utilize to grow. And where you have bacteria growing, you've got a potential food source for animals. And is the bottom of the food web, it's, it's always bacterial. There's nothing more complex than that. In these environments, yes, the base of the food web is bacterial. In the deep sea, of course, there's no light. So very little of the primary production, very little of the food produced by photosynthesis on the surface of the ocean makes it into the deep sea. So the primary base of the food web is, in fact, bacterial chemoautotrophy or chemosynthesis. And who are, the, uh, who are the, say, big players in this food web? How does that energy then transfer through the system? Well, I guess the biggest players, in my opinion, which is a little different from a microbiologist, the <laughs> microbiologist would be all about the free-living bacteria, but I am all about the bigger animals, specifically the ones that have bacteria inside them. They're symbiotic with the bacteria that produce the energy and the food they need to grow. And one of the most amazing of these are the uh, hydrothermal vent tube worm. And these are the animals that first caught my interest and in, was the focus of much of my early research. They're the sort of iconic creatures that we think of when we think of hydrothermal vents. You always see those huge calcareous tubes and then the, is it gills that are exposed at the top, the deep red? Yes, it is a type of a gill that you see sticking out of the tube of these worms. Uh, The red is blood. It's very well vascularized. And that gill is actually, that plume, as we call it for the tube worms, is where they take up the dissolved gases that they will transport to the bacteria deep inside their body. In fact, one of the first amazing things we learned about these animals is that unlike virtually all other red-blooded animals on Earth, their blood is not poisoned by hydrogen sulfide, like ours is. Rather, their blood can bind and transport that toxic chemical deep inside their tissues to feed their bacteria. Well, do they have a dedicated pigment for that? It's their hemoglobin. It's a very special hemoglobin. The hemoglobin actually has sites to carry oxygen, just like ours, 
but it also has other sites to carry hydrogen sulfide. Oh, that's incredible. What's sort of the history of the worms? Do we know how they evolved to be so specialized? What's their closest ancestor? Well, they are a type of annelid worm. They apparently evolved in the deep sea. The most ancestral ones appear to have been tube worms found around cold seeps, which are just a little less toxic, if you will, than a hydrothermal vent, but still have all the (laughs) necessary chemicals. So yeah, they evolved from a rather normal shallow water worm and uh, just got some really amazing adaptations. When they were first discovered, they were so weird that scientists thought they must be maybe their own phylum. But it turns out they're not. They're just a member of a rather large phylum of annelids. I had no idea that the actual symbiotes were were quite deep within the body. I assumed they were on the plumes. It's incredible that that's transported and the animal has has arranged itself so, so completely to transport to this internal farm. Absolutely. And if you think about it for a minute, I think you can see why, in this case, the symbionts need to be in an internal organ. These are big worms. These worms can be over a meter in length, weigh hundreds of grams, and they're pretty active. So they require a lot of energy, a lot of food, which means a lot of bacteria. So deep inside these worms, in where their normal gut would be, is a specialized sac. It's called the troposome, and that sac is basically just a bag of bacteria. That's incredible. I, I had no idea there was a dedicated organ, and it, it would have been a stomach long ago, but now it, it's sort of a bacterial farm. Well, yes and no. People who studied the evolution of the troposome say that it actually did not evolve from the same tissue that gut evolves from. But it certainly is in the place where a gut would be. And it functions much like a gut, but it did not evolve from a gut. That's just even more interesting. (laughs) So what is it the bacteria are releasing and how is it obtaken by the organism if that's not gut tissue? Well, the tissue is very well vascularized, as you might imagine, because all the gases that the bacteria need to live and grow have to come in through the blood. And the three primary gases for a tube worm are hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, which is used to oxidize the sulfide and produce energy, and CO2, which they fix in a manner very analogous to the way a green plant does. Hmm. So a green plant will use the energy from sunlight to fix carbon and produce the food that the rest of the surface of the earth consumes. In the case of the tube worms, they use the energy from the oxidation of hydrogen sulfide to fix carbon that then they can live and grow off. That's amazing as it is, but they're amazingly heat tolerant as well, aren't they? They're, they're, they tend to be the, the ones right near the vent itself. Yeah. So for a deep sea animal, they're heat tolerant. But keep in mind that most of the deep sea is a little under two degrees centigrade in temperature. The tube worms actually don't live in remarkably high temperatures. For the most part, you find tube worms at about room temperature, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 degrees centigrade. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's quite warm for the deep sea, and that's where they thrive. There are other animals found around vents that can live at higher temperatures that actually live very close to the very hot venting water. And some of those can tolerate temperatures up to 50 and 60 degrees, but really, you know, not much more than, for example, a desert ant might experience on a hot day. The real stars of of thriving in high temperatures are the thermophilic bacteria. And some of those can live quite happily at temperatures above that which water would boil on the surface of the earth. And are those found at the vent systems themselves? They absolutely are. You do find them on hot springs on the surface of the earth, places like Yellowstone. But one of the factors at the vents that allows the bacteria to thrive at even higher temperatures is that the high pressure keeps water from boiling at 100 degrees centigrade. Hmm. In fact, water at several hundred degrees centigrade doesn't boil at hydrothermal vents. So it's still quite happily liquid and amenable to life. We discussed that the animals are actually surprisingly active, but this must drive quite a high metabolism as well. So do they need a a larger amount of energy than you would expect because they're, they're living at an elevated temperature? Or have they got ways of slowing down their metabolism so they don't burn through too fast? Well, again, with the tube worms, their metabolism is very high for a deep sea animal. In fact, one of the early theories was that deep sea animals would have a very low metabolic rate because of the high pressure. Well, one thing we learned from hydrothermal vents is that high pressure does not always result in a low metabolic rate. (laughs) Temperature is much more important, and food supply. At hydrothermal vents, we have solid, moderate, warm temperatures and an abundant food supply. So yes, you get a variety of animals there 
that have kind of normal metabolic rates compared to other animals on Earth and very high metabolic rates for deep sea animals. Yeah, it seems a very active place relative to a lot of the deep sea that, that we spend our time looking at. You know, one of the really amazing things I think about the discovery of events is that that is where, you know, over a mile down that the first chemoautotrophic symbiosis, the first symbiosis with bacteria that utilize sulfide or methane or whatever was discovered. But shortly after that, took another look at a variety of other animals and found out that this type of symbiosis is actually quite widespread <laughs> in all kinds of different worms and clams and shrimp and crabs in a variety of different environments all over the planet. So once we knew what to look for, we started seeing it everywhere. And I mean, even in the terrestrial plants, like the organelles that perform photosynthesis, the theory is that they used to be a symbiont anyway, and then they became thoroughly integrated into the cells. So it's maybe not as strange, we're just used to seeing plants. Right. And these animals are, in fact, very analogous to plants, especially the ones that have fully embraced the symbiosis and lost their gut, like the tube worms. In addition to studying hydrothermal vents, I've done a lot of work at cold seeps in places like the Gulf of Mexico where the water's not hot, but it's coming up from deep sources of hydrocarbon, so it's energy-rich. There's a lot of reduced chemicals, sulfide and methane in them. And the two berms that live there are really analogous to plants. One way is that they have long roots, actually a single root that goes deep into the soil, and they use that to extract the sulfide from the sediment beneath them. And then, like many plants on the surface, they can live for hundreds and hundreds of years, just sitting in one place, taking their nutrients up from the soil, if you will, oxygen from the seawater, and living a life that really is a lot like a plant. That is a completely new one on me. What are those called? I think we'll have to do some wider reading. Yeah, so it's another kind of vestimentiferin tube worm that is a tube worm related to those found at hydrothermal vents. The, the two I work with most in the Gulf of Mexico are in two groups, Ascarpia and Lamellabrachia. That's a totally new one on me. The growing like tree roots is, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a brilliant analogy. You know, we'd worked on the seeps for a long time. I, I probably dove there for five years thinking that these tube worms must be a lot like the vent tube worms that I knew pretty well. And then it was just like an alarm went off in my head one day, and I said, you know, this is a completely different ecology. These things aren't growing like gangbusters, <laughs> living fast and dying young. They had a completely different life history and a completely different approach to life. We've got sort of different layers. There's the very adapted symbionts where the, they've got novel structures and the bacteria is very much integrated into their bodies and it's more of a partnership. Then there seems to be the farmers who actually eat the bacteria like they're a, a crop. And then I guess we go the next level up the, the trophic chain and, and who's eating these people? Well, you know, there aren't a lot of animals that eat tube worms. And that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, these things can live for hundreds of years just sitting there, <laughs> even in relatively deep water, you know, half a mile deep water where there's not a lot of other food. And we think that's partially due to the fact that their blood is probably quite toxic. It can bind the sulfide, you know, and protect the animals from the deleterious effects of sulfide. But if the animal's eaten and that blood is acidified, it'll release all the sulfide. So they could be quite toxic. Now, some of the other animals that graze on bacteria or have bacteria, in fact, in their gills, like mussels and clams, do have other predators that do come to the seeps and eat them. But even those predators that come to these places have to have some special adaptations because the places can be quite toxic. They're low in oxygen, they're high in sulfide, and they're just not an environment that all animals can tolerate. We've touched on a little bit the differences among the different vent systems sort of at the, at the oceanic level. What are the sort of main categories of hydrothermal vents, maybe including cold seeps in there as well? It sounds like there's, there's different communities in the different oceans. Absolutely. And even at vents that are chemically quite similar, and formed in places where the plates are spreading apart, you have biogeographical differences in the fauna you find there. Just like you find different animals in Africa and South America, you know, Europe and the United States, due to biogeography, due to the history of the earth. In different places on the seafloor, we'll find different arrays of animals. 
In the Pacific, in different places, we have a variety of different kinds of tube worms, mostly dominating, but also clams and mussels. If you go north off the coast of Canada or the Pacific Northwest, we have different species of tube worms and different species of clams and mussels. And then, as I mentioned before, if you go into the Arctic or into the Mid-Atlantic, we have communities where you see almost no tube worms, but abundant mussels. And the vents themselves, at least the hydrothermal vents, on the sort of geological context and on an evolutionary context, they're fairly ephemeral. They're fairly short-lived. So what happens when a vent stops, when it moves off the hotspot and it starts to cool? Is there a progression of communities as it starts to, to wind down? So I guess there's a variety of ways to approach that question. Certainly within an individual vent that the, the venting starts to wane, sometimes they just kind of get clogged. The plumbing gets clogged from all those metal-rich fluids that are coming up, and it might just start venting 10 meters away or 100 meters or a kilometer away. And in that situation, the tube worms that are attached to the seafloor, when that particular spigot that they're tied to turns off, they're going to die. However, they do produce larvae. They produce sperm and eggs that can then come up into the water column and spend months in the water column. And some of the very, very lucky few will settle at a new vent. And in fact, when brand new vents pop up on the seafloor, and as scientists, we've seen this happen, especially when they're in the neighborhood of other vents, the time course for settlement is just amazing. You'll have new tube worms settling and growing to reproductive size in less than a year. That's amazing. And because we know the origin of those vents, we, we have a nice growth rate. We can tell that those tube worms weren't there before. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some places that have been really intensively studied, like along the East Pacific Rise, where all the different countries that have good deep submergence research capabilities have been working for a long time. And there's some places that we've gone back to at least every other year for decades. So in those places, when there's a tectonic event, it's often been visited immediately after or immediately before, and then plans are made to come back as soon as possible. So yes, we have actually seen this happen, seen vents that quit and new vents that started and been able to follow the progression in detail, sometimes even with um, cameras that have been left down for months to document what's going on. Incredible. There used to be these sort of sporadic, mysterious things, but it sounds like we're getting a better idea of where to look for them. And uh, we're going back and visiting favorites and seeing how they progress over time. Yes, indeed. And then I guess the other part of that question is the fact that over longer periods of time, whole sections of the seafloor may shut down and, and another section hundreds or a thousand kilometers away could open up. And those vents also get recolonized amazingly quickly. And there is uh, an amazing amount of genetic continuity along ridge crests for thousands of miles in some cases, where the same species is moving back and forth up and down the uh, spreading center. Amazing. Are they just playing the odds? Are they just releasing a lot of larvae and that hoping that some sort of find their way back up? I, I could see how down current yep. vents would be seeded, but uh, do we know how they get to the top again? They float. They are absolutely playing the odds. <laughs> they are producing millions of sperm and eggs and larvae. You know, one tube worm will produce millions in the hopes that one or two might eventually find a suitable place. Now, these are tiny larvae. They can't swim someplace new, so they are entirely reliant upon ocean currents to move them horizontally. They can move themselves vertically simply by adjusting buoyancy. So if they're very buoyant, when they first hatch, they'll float up into the water column. If at a later stage in their development, they become negatively buoyant, they will sink out of the water column. In the hope that they land on a favorable spot. Yeah. You know, I think one of the places that really brought this home to me was, again, with these two worms in the Gulf of Mexico. First of all, we would find a tiny little cold seep spot with very little activity and find on one little rock where we see nothing else for hundreds and hundreds of meters around, both of the species, the tube worms that live in that part of the Gulf would have found that spot and settled on it. <laughs> now, how many larvae have sunk to the wrong spot? They have a whole bunch of them, hundreds of them. Yeah. Find this little spot that's the size of a basketball and form a group there. And then if you kind of think over long time periods, Basically, each male and female tube worm has to replace itself over its lifetime. If it does more than replace itself, then over thousands of years, the tube worms are going to take over the planet. 
right? They're just <laughs> grow out of control. <laughs> so basically, these animals with a very large reproductive capacity, spawning every year, every few years, for hundreds of years, only two of their offspring from a pair of tube worms is going to survive to you know, make more tube worms. And that's a win. That counts as success. You've replaced yourself. That's a total win. Yeah. And, you know, too bad for the other billion babies that didn't make it. I wonder if we've accidentally introduced invasive species. I know the chances are so, so low, but like in vessel bilge water and things like that, I know that's much more of a problem in, in shallower waters. But I, I wonder if we're going to accidentally cross-pollinate, you know, some bio box that wasn't quite scrubbed well enough on a, on a new research leg accidentally brings a Pacific tube worm to the Atlantic. <laughs> it's really a great question. And scientists have gotten concerned about it. It took a little while. Oh, really? This has been thought about? Oh, absolutely. And especially there are um, buoyancy compensation on a small scale that happens with submarines like the Alvin by pumping water in and out, bring water in to get heavy, pump water out to get light. And of course, that water could carry bacteria, organisms, or disease you know, from one vent site to another. What do you think are the big outstanding questions in vent research? Well, one of the questions that we've been investigating for many, many years that I still don't think we've really nailed is how all the different vent species colonize other vents. Are there real stepping stones between vents that are used by vent species? How far can they go? What are the triggers that get them to a new vent and cause them to settle? I mean, I think we know the answers to these questions in broad brushstrokes. But right down at the biological level, there's a lot of details still to be worked out. Still plenty to do. Oh, yeah. One of the things we like to do on the show, particularly because the deep sea has such a bad track record for it, is there anything you want to set the record straight on? Is there any little factoid you hear over and over again that is just wrong? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. So one of the ones early on was the, the first people that discovered the vent tube worms were geologists. And they brought them up on the deck of a ship and they stretched them out and their tubes can be three meters long. So people for years and years and years, and I still hear it, talk about tube worms that are meters long. Well, in fact, there are no tube worms we know of, no hydrothermal vent tube worms especially, that are meters long. They have tubes that are meters long, but the animals themselves, a giant vent tube worm, is a meter long. So does the animal itself sort of move up the tube? Yes. So what these tube worms can do, they're, they're in a giant clump, and these clumps can be you know, meters high, but the tube worms are competing with each other to get their gill-like plume into the energy-rich seawater. So they're constantly growing their tubes to keep their plume up there. And what the tube worms actually do is they, they can grow tube quite quickly, and then they will lay down new partitions in their tube for the base. So the tube worm is only occupying the top half a meter or meter of the tube at a time, but the tube can be much longer. Now, having said that, the tube worms that may get that long are the hydrocarbon seep ones, but most of the length of those animals is just the hair-like root, a single root that can go meters into the sediment with a tube worm that's sticking out of the sediment by over a meter. So those thin worms, generally only as big around as a pencil, actually can get to be several meters long. So you've got 30 seconds for someone's attention. How do you get them really excited about vents? What's your like go-to fact? <laughs> you know, the deep sea is a long ways from the consciousness of most people. And in fact, many people really wonder why we care about the deep sea. But the fact of the matter is, the deep sea is connected to the rest of the ocean. Impacts of the deep sea will impact the rest of the ocean. And we really don't understand much of what's going on in the deep sea. And although people may think that this is not critical knowledge for the planet, it is critical knowledge. Because if we mess up the ocean in any significant way, we're going to hurt billions of people on Earth. And we're finding more and more examples of commercially important species that rely on the deep sea for nursery grounds, you know, a place to either lay their eggs or for their young to thrive. Yeah, a lot of energy is entering the system. It's at these pinpoints, but they're, yeah, they're converting a lot of chemical energy into biological energy. So that's going to be supporting wider ecosystems. Absolutely. That's fantastic. My own work has been sort of deep sea vent adjacent, but I've never got a chance to sort of properly get involved. So um, I learned a great deal. Thanks so much for talking with us, Chuck. I really enjoyed that. Absolutely. It was fun. Thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to hearing it. 
there was, there was genuine surprises in there for me. Yeah. There was genuine things I didn't know about. And, and again, it's, it's fascinating how even though we're meant to be deep sea people, as soon as you take the spotlight off your sort of target area, I, I'm full of all those factoids, all of those things that have been perpetuated that just aren't true. Yeah. So massive sympathy for anyone in the general public who's just got an interest in the deep sea. Hello again. This is oceanographer and explorer Don Walsh. And for today's Sea Story program, I'd like to tell you about Lunch at the Vents. In the late 90s, I worked with an adventure diving company called Deep Ocean Expeditions. They had a simple business plan, take adventurers to famous seafloor sites in the deep ocean. And I might add adventurers with a fairly generous purse. And these would be to uh, sites deeper than scuba or sport diving. We're talking about going to the deep sea floor thousands of feet below the surface of the ocean. There were initially three basic products offered. Titanic, uh, the depth of 12,500 feet. Uh, the World War II German battleship Bismarck at a depth of 15,500 feet. And then various hydrothermal vent fields. And that's what I'll talk about today. We used two Russian man submersibles, Mir-1 and Mir-2, the word Mir being the Russian word for peace. And they were supported by their mothership, Keldish, which was uh, also used to house our adventure divers because our typical expedition would be to take several of them with us and we'd be out perhaps for two weeks. The Mir subs were built in Finland and are capable of diving to 20,000 feet, which means that they could reach 98% of the seafloor in the world ocean. And despite the tourism aspect of all the DOE uh, diving operations, we did some scientific work on all the dives. The mirrors were fitted with instrumented sensors and physical sampling devices. Well, these subs uh, actually could carry two tourist adventurers plus the Russian pilot. So by diving together each day, four adventurers could dive per day, and that made a, an attractive business proposition. These were the only deep diving man submersibles in the world that could dive together. So this is really a, a unique capability or opportunity for deep ocean expeditions. I was fortunate to make uh, dives at all of the three major offerings of deep ocean expeditions. And that usually happened when somebody had booked one of these adventure dives and then had to cancel at the last minute. So we were left with uh, open seats. Then people like me, staff member, could get a chance to have the, the adventure. And they weren't cheap. It cost about $40,000 for Bismarck, which is the deepest dive. That was a, about a 14-hour dive. $35,000 for Titanic, a 12-hour dive. And around $18,000 for a 9-hour dive to the hydrothermal vents. In October 1999, I dove to 8,000 feet at the Rainbow Vent Field at the Azores. The vents uh, rise from the seafloor like massive organ pipes. They're quite spectacular. There's an amazing amount of rather normal-looking critters, such as fish, forms, crabs, and shellfish around the vents. But they have nothing to do with similar life forms in the upper layers of the ocean. This is a parallel life system that was essentially unknown until the late 1970s. So it was indeed like visiting another planet. I mean, you dove down from the surface of the ocean was maybe three or four hours in the dark, and you get to the seafloor, and here's this whole different world. It was a profound experience, at least for me. And I call this experience a dive to the edge of creation. And indeed, some experts have suggested that life on our planet may have found its beginnings in these deep ocean hydrothermal areas where you have heat, you have nutrients, and life can then proceed. Well, when we landed in the vents area, it was halfway through our nine-hour dive, so it was time for lunch. We were next to a rather large vent, which had lots of critters moving on and around it, so we left our outside lights on while we enjoyed our box lunches. And to set the mood, we teed up the Beatles' We All Live in a Yellow Submarine tune on our tape deck inside the cabin. Considering the venue, it was one of the most memorable lunches I ever had, even though the Russian-built sandwiches are not very good. Well, that was over two decades ago, and today DOE is no longer in business, as we can no longer charter the mere subs. The Russian Academy of Sciences had retired them. So, adventure diving was interesting work while it lasted, and I'm sure glad to be part of it. Well, that's all for now, and thanks for listening. And that concludes this pressurized version of the Deep Sea Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to go into some more detail, you can find the full episode in the feed. Just match the episode numbers. We'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already.
If you would like to advertise with the Deep Sea Podcast, feel free to get in touch. Our audience is primarily young people with an interest in science, often undergraduates or people considering a degree in marine science, but it also includes established scientists. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in reaching these groups.